where I met Ronnie. This was at the Palais, Monday, January the 29th, 2001. Day it all changed. Da, da, da. <laughs> When I first started emceeing back in Christchurch, you know, like all of the people that I sort of were looking up to in terms of emcees were guys. They were either guys that were coming over from the UK and playing raves in uh, in Christchurch, or they were guys' voices that I were, were, was hearing on mixtapes that we used to get sent over from the UK. They used to have a show called One in the Jungle on the BBC, and you know, someone over in London would record it and send it back to uh, Christchurch and the tape would get passed around and everyone would listen to it. So I'd hear people like Navigator and Moose and GQ, um, you know, and they were all guys. And then I remember one time I heard a mixtape and I heard a girl's voice on there. And I was like, oh, there's some female voices. You know, so there are women out there doing it. Um, and then there was people like Chemistry and Storm, who came and played in New Zealand, you know, two very strong, powerful women. And I remember meeting them and saying, I want to be like you. And Chemistry said, oh, do you want to be a DJ, do you? And I was like, well, I don't know if I want to be a DJ, but maybe an MC. And her and Storm were like, well, if that's what you want to do, girl, like, you know, you should do it. We don't have enough women. And so I thought, okay, maybe there is a place for me. Maybe I can go over there and bring my style. We had this sort of really cool little scene guy in Christchurch, and then she moved to Melbourne. She was like, right, she wanted to give it a crack, you know, and moved to Melbourne. And we kept in contact, and I was touring a lot, so I was going to Melbourne a lot with my band, Sound on the Dub, and we're doing Europe and all this stuff. So I'd see her quite a bit coming through, you know, like, stop in Melbourne there. And then, um, yeah, I just heard through the grapevine that she, um, she corner Ronnie's size, <laughs> as Tali would do. So I just walked up to Ronnie and introduced myself and said, um, Tali, I'm Australasia's only female MC. And uh, he was like, okay, wicked. Show me what you got. I was like, what? He's like, MC in my hair, come on then. I was like, what, right now here? And he's like, yeah, come on then, girl, come on. So I was like, all right. So I just, I just you know, for a split second, I almost was like, nah, 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 nah. Be stupid, but I was like, nah, this is the opportunity. Right there and then, emceed in his ear, sang for him as well, and he was like, wicked. Go and take the mic off Dynamite. I was like, what? He goes, go and take the mic off Dynamite. I was like, probably no way. But he's like, come on then, girl. He took me by the hand, he took me into the booth, he's like, Dynamite, give the mic. I was like, what? But he's like, trust me, trust me, give the mic. So I took the mic. Then one day, I got a step on the mic, alright. Emceed for die. Party with them for 48 hours and I said I want to move to England and they were like well if you do you know you come and find us so three months later I moved to England with my best friend Missy and I found them I think a few months went past and obviously Represent was still just on tour touring around the UK and I remember we was uh, in London we did a show in London and I can remember it as clear as day it was fantastic it was a brilliant show we'd done and then, as soon as we finished the show, we all got back on the bus. Whole crew of us, I think Brian G was there, all the V recordings massive. I think there was Becky, uh, everyone from Four Cycle, Cross Died, Side John, everyone was there. And then this girl, she jumped, jumps on the bus, she's just come popping along. She's like, oh, remember me? There we are, all on the bus, having a laugh. And I'm like, hey, everyone, shh. Check this girl out. Trust me, everyone was like, first of all, what is going on? And then all of a sudden, Tali steps up. She gets on the bus in front of everyone and she just starts busting lyric after lyric after lyric, flow after flow after flow, and she starts to kill it. And I'm like, whoa! Everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa! And I remember she blew the bus apart. And it was great to see someone come in with not being intimidated by the, the, the drum and bass scene or being intimidated by you know, all of us on the bus, and she just fitted straight into what we were doing. What I and what we recognised was just the kind of fearless energy. It was a, a breath of fresh air to full cycle because we, we had that fearlessness in us too. You know, we were part of a genre and a music that was, that was breaking barriers, that wasn't asking for directions. You know, we weren't seeking direction. We were making our own pathways and we were, we were laying down the pathways for people to follow. And, you know, when we saw her, she was she was doing the same. She just embraced the music. She loved the music. She's a great performer. She's also good in the studio. You know, you have that balance of being <clears throat> the live energy with the songwriting energy. 
I think like when I first got there, the, the main goal for me was that I wanted to become part of their crew. I wanted to be like the first lady of Full Cycle in terms of being the first female MC that they sort of um, brought in to the fold. And I, I think for them, they felt like the timing was right as well. So initially it was just that I wanted to be a part of their crew. I wanted to roll with them. I wanted to MC with them. But obviously being a songwriter, I had in mind, you know, the, the idea that maybe we, we'd record tunes together. It was actually Ronnie's idea that, you know, we, we do a Tali album. I remember I was going to Bristol back and forth on the train from London because I was still living in London and working with all of them in turn. So I started out working with Sal first and kind of doing stuff with him, but it was, it was much more, um, it was much more, about Sub's projects and what he wanted to do, which was fine because I got a lot of experience working with him. Um, but when I eventually started working with Ronnie and going into the studio and working with him and he could sort of see my ambition and how dedicated I was and, and how much I I wanted to put music out, he actually sat me down and said to me, I've got three proposals for you. One was that I should move to Bristol and you know, be there all the time. So I wasn't traveling back and forth. Two was that they wanted to sign me as an artist to Full Cycle. And three, he said, let's make a Tali album. Not a Crust album, not a Die album, not a Ronnie album, but a Tali album where your name is first and foremost and we produce for you. And I was like, yes, yes and yes. <laughs> Ronnie Sires represent when they went touring over to Australia, they saw her. And for me, it kind of must have been like a... Um, a Marky moment, like when I went to Brazil and I saw Marky, I think that's the kind of vibe. They probably saw Tali and they thought, wow, this girl's a crazy talent. And it's crazy because usually, like, you hear about people before they come here, like you hear their music or something like that, but she just came and, like, no one knew anything about Tali. She hadn't recorded no music. She was just, just this, this white girl that was fronting the hottest DB hut. At the time, which was like the four cycle boys represent. Come to the New Zealand drum bass scene, that's a huge connection, right? Like, we've never had a, 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 a connection like that before, right? Um, well, no. Well, not that I know. Well, yeah, yeah, not like that, not like that. And it, and it really opened up what's possible for a lot of us back here as well. And we're all trying to break down that wall, you know? It's really hard to be from outside of the UK trying to bust in with that style of music. At the time of change, you know, like, every, yeah, there was a sort of established British boys club, um, and that was hard enough to break into if you were a dude from New Zealand. MCs weren't just uh, big burly dudes anymore, and uh, Tally Board and Energy and a staunchness, um, you know, from a little wahine from down in Aotearoa to the whole world, which was quite, quite special, quite magical. At the same time, there was a whole bunch of producers coming through, myself and Josh, Tikitane was on buttons, there was uh, Concord Dawn, and then, like, a little while after that as well, there was, like, State of Mind and uh, the Upbeats, and everyone... Everyone took their cues from what happened with Tali and Ronnie Sides. It's like, Lyric of My Lip was quite possibly one of the biggest tunes to ever happen for New Zealand electronic bass music, and to this day. Man, that was like, she mainlined it straight into Bristol and was working with one of the most respected, badass drum and bass producers on the planet. It was somewhat of a, of a landmark occasion insofar as there weren't really a lot of like vocal led LPs around then. You know, that was still the era where MCs and vocalists were very much secondary to DJs and to producers. So the idea that there would actually be like a body of work spearheaded by a vocalist or an MC. That was interesting. That was that was cool. You know, not even long after I signed to the label and was living in Bristol, they took me to America. Like, first of all, I went to America with um, Crust and Die doing uh, their project, I Comanche. So I recorded some stuff with them for that project and I got to tour with them. Right. Here I am in New York. Can you fucking believe it? <laughs> Hi. Building. 
Right now we're doing an in-store in Fujian. Fujian. <laughs> The first single that came out was Lyric on My Lip and that just blew up. Like it was beyond crazy. I mean I had people messaging me in New Zealand going, Did I just hear you on a song? <laughs> and I was printing Lyric on My Lip, the title track, for years, and I still draw it to this day. I think one of the uh fave mixes was from Ed Rush and Optical. So when I heard this um album, that was the tune that was licking in the dance. I could hear the influences of the 90s. You can hear a, a, a bit of Dillinger in there. You can you can hear a little bit of us in there. Uh, big up my trip family. I actually have a really, really fond memory of hearing that tune for the first time because I was at an international gig at FUBAR and I remember us on the dance floor and that intro started and that amazing voice just cut through that incredible foo uh, sound system. Anybody who's from Auckland or anywhere in New Zealand or any of the international DJs who used to visit Fubar will know that it had such a great sound and vibe in that room, in that main room. And heard that lyric on my lip intro start and then the drop and the room went nuts and I'm pretty sure Bailey rewound that, pulled it up and played it again and just the way that clean vocal just cut through those on those speakers and it was just such a, it was such a moment. The first time I heard Lyric on my lip, I was at um, Cycling Milk Keats and yeah, DJ Marky was playing there and it was one of his first ever European shows and so everyone was very excited, there was some hype but then he started playing this tune, Lyric on my lip. And I was like, what the hell is this? Like, who is this girl? Like, amazing. Like, I was so inspired by it. You know, she was singing, she was rapping, like the lyrics were amazing. And this is kind of just before AI or as we, we saw it was making tunes by us. Not cool. as AI. And we just heard a tune drop and you know she was rude that her whole tone and that was different. And then I remember seeing uh, not too long after it come out, I think she was performing I think it's the Coliseum or Fast or something like that came to it down there and she was just like toasting and rapping and singing. I was just like, wow, this girl's sick. And I remember, I swear it was crossed, cross started. And I remember, um, yeah, seeing Tali, Tali turned up and she was in like full camo. Um, like, yeah, full like fatigue with a hat on and that. And um, yeah, it was just like so professional and so like, and I'd never heard lyric on my lip before, so I was just like, wow, what's, you know what I mean? Who's this and that? Brian G and Jumping Jack Frost played the lyric on my lip, and I it, it totally blew my, blew my mind, like, when I heard it, because I loved the tune so much. And uh, I remember when they gave me the test press, and I just played it, and I uh, just loved the tune of me and XRS. I finally got my hands on a copy of that record. I heard DJ Cross play it when he came out here. And I was like, what the hell, Tali's smashing it. And then the next thing you know, I am in Miami and I think it was like two or three days later, I played it for the very first time. And uh, the next thing you know, the whole club's going off. Boom, reload, boom, reload, boom, reload. That tune was just fire. I remember going to Topshop in London, huge big department store, four story department store. And they used to play uh, UK MTV music videos. And I was shopping. Lyric on my lip came up, up on, on the screen. And I remember just stopping and being like, I could hear myself and I looked up and I was on all these screens and I just wanted to 
shout out, that's me up on that screen. But of course I couldn't, I was just like, mm -hmm. It was the days of just MTV. So people saw you on the TV and that was how they got to know your music. Well, they heard your music on the radio or in the clubs. You know, it was before YouTube, even before MySpace, you know. It was actually blazing when that came out that, um, you know, our management got in touch and were like, hey, like we think we should be making a music video for this. And I think it was because they could see there was a crossover appeal for me. Um, I was reaching the drum and bass audiences, but like Lyric on My Lip was getting played by Joe Wiley on the BBC Radio 1. I remember the first time I heard that man, I knew it was going to be played on the radio. And I was sitting in the car with Becky, our label manager, and the song came on and I just cried. It was such a big thing for me. Um, but yeah, when, when Blazing came out and they were like, okay, we're going to make a music video for it. Um, I remember I went to a pub and met these two guys, um, uh, Phil and Ollie, I think, from Diamond Dogs, and they sort of said, look, you know, this is the concept. So I guess they were pitching pitching the concept to me, but I didn't really know what was going on. I was like, okay, I'm having this meeting about a music video, and they showed me these storyboards, and I was kind of like, wow, this is cool, you know, like I'm into this. This bit at the beginning with, um, before she goes into the club, she pulls up in the, in the Porsche. It's this dirty, disgusting alley in East London behind Brick Lane. And there, there was just sort of syringes and old condoms and dead dogs. And ah, it's just the most disgusting place. It was place the only place we could really think where you could set fire to the street, really. Yeah. <laughs> Do the whole back to the future thing of Tali as this ethereal being coming in in her flaming Porsche. What's interesting, if you look at the actual rushes of just Tali performing before it's edited, it's, I mean, it's good to go. The music video for Blazing. And Crest and Ronnie were watching me and I was just like, you know, the camera and shit, and they were like, uh, oh, Tally. <laughs> like, how do you know how to do that? I was like, man, I've been practicing for this day since I was 14 with my hairbrush in front of the mirror. Man, my mum and dad were over from New Zealand and they'd come over to see me play at Glastonbury and they'd come to see me on set doing my music video and they were sort of standing in the background. They arrived as I was shooting and I remember seeing them out of the corner of my eye and my dad was crying, you know, and my dad's like a, you know, a bloke, an ex-farmer from Taranaki and he was so emotional and they were just like, oh, so proud. And I was proud that they were proud, you know, so that was a really beautiful moment. <laughs> energy around um, this music video that was about to come out on TV was very much like uh, we have to see this song, we have to see um, this music video and we can't wait. Everybody was just like super excited. For me, the track Blazin was definitely, uh, definitely the one. I kind of had everything. I had that trademark full cycle sound and everything was just kind of perfectly in the groove in that one. Um, and I've noticed that, you know, whenever uh, tally tracks were dropped uh, by the DJ that women came to the dance floor and that really changes the dynamic of the dance floor in whatever club or rave you're in. So after we, you know, started putting some tunes out and I was playing here and there, it was about showcasing the album material and taking it live. So initially we did a showcase uh, back at Cargo where I filmed Blazing and Di was my DJ. Here you are, sitting in the coat room. This is Di. but going forward I mean he was so busy we had to find somebody else and because I was determined to have more women uh, you know coming in and and uh, rolling with me um, I asked DJ Daisy who was uh, who is a prolific DJ from Bristol part of the Rough Neck Ting crew um, and Daisy was like yeah I'd love to do that all of a sudden, this feisty wee slip of a New Zealander 
uh, started absolutely smashing sets on stage on the mic with the Full Cycle crew. And she quickly became a good friend and lived across the road from me, which was nice. And it was also nice when she asked me to be her DJ when her album was ready to test on the road. I actually have some of the CDs uh, from that time because I'm such a hoarder um, with set lists as well included in them and little instructions of how I needed to mix the tracks. This is the cover spot, Trench Yard Car Park in Bristol. It's brilliant. I knew it would get the sun all day. You can come up here at whatever time. It was a classic, iconic, you know, bright blue sky Bristol. So I don't necessarily know if I knew at that time it was going to be for the um, album cover and just being able to be a part of that whole vibe, you know, is, is brilliant, you know, for, from the single releases to the album releases to, to all the press shots as well, you know. I did play, you know, my small part in, in, in getting that vision across. So after we'd taken the music uh, on the road and done a, a few showcases, Ronnie was like, okay, I'm going on tour with the live band to showcase my new music. I think you should use the same band and we do Lyric On My Lip live. At the time, I was lucky enough to be studio manager for Full Cycle Studios down in Barton Hill in Bristol. We had a live room set up with all the live gear for rehearsing and building the show because we were building the show of the Lyric on my lip album at the same time as recording and mixing it. Running into the live room, taking samples, rehearsing the track, seeing if it worked live. Maybe it didn't. We had to change some bits and bobs up. Maybe we added sounds and parts while we were playing live that then went into the track in the studio. So it was a real to and fro and from the studio situation into live and, and back and forth. So that was really exciting because it meant that I had use of these incredible musicians, Yuval on drums, Sai John on double bass, um, D Product who was on keys and samples. Then when it was time to take the band on tour, again, I was very insistent that I have some woman to join me on the road and I wanted, I wanted two backing singers because a lot of my music is full of harmonies and in order to showcase that you needed the extra voices so I asked Ronnie and initially he was like, no, no, it's, you know, it's two extra people that have to come on the bus. And I was like, no, I must have a woman come on the bus with me. You know, I'm just a bunch of, me and a bunch of dudes. So I asked my girlfriends, Zanaya and Holly G. Holly, I'd already done some stuff with, uh, with Sav and with I Comanche Crust and Dice Project. So I knew she was good. And Zanaya, I just heard her sing casually and was like, she's got a pretty voice and she's really cool. So yeah, next thing you know, it's us three girls and a bunch of boys on a bus rolling around Europe. And uh, me and the girls also came in toward New Zealand and Australia. So how are we all doing tonight, Ben? My name is Tali. I'm promoting an album called Lyric On My Lip. It's out on Full Cycle. You're ready, Brian? We got some trouble bass in the house. She invited me into her house upstairs. Her kitchen was literally above this ceiling. And she asked me to join her on the road as her backing singer. One minute um, I was at home in Bristol. Next minute I was on the road with the Full Cycle band and MC Tali touring Europe, UK. Um, Australia, New Zealand, it was the time of my life. What I remember the most about touring Lyric on My Lip was really the sense of sisterhood. Um, you know, the three of us together sort of traveling the world. And I suppose the standout moments for me were more, more than the performance was actually warming up behind like, backstage, doing our vocal warm ups together. We had so much confidence and we had so much fun, but mainly being together as a sisterhood, that was my most memorable part of it. <laughs> moments you know we were really blessed and everybody seemed really grateful to be 
working a job where they got to hang out with their friends and colleagues and have a really amazing time. You know, and I, I still am amazed I got to meet people like The Streets and Pharrell Williams and go to Glastonbury and meet The Roots. You know, stuff like that made all of the hard work really worth it. One week would be a live show with the band and then the following week I'd have to fly to America with Ronnie to play a show down in Mexico and then I'd come home and we'd get back on the bus and we'd, we'd go and do a tour around England, you know, we're playing Birmingham and Sheffield and, um, and, and London, things like that. So it was so full on, like, I mean, my mental and physical health definitely suffered because I just was constantly working that whole time and it really does take its toll on a person. Um, so there was definitely moments where I was I struggled, my voice struggled, physically I struggled, but, you know, I was living my dream. There was no way that I was not ever going to get on that bus and go on tour. You know, she had to work harder than a lot of other people because the fact that she's a, a shit, a female in this predominantly dominated male industry, um, so she had to work really hard and she had to really continually fight prove herself, you know what I mean? And even though it was tough, and I know she had a lot of ups and downs, and she, you know, she, um, she, it was really tough for her, and a lot of times she wanted to give it all up and throw it all in. And, you know, mental health as well, Tali's mental health, just from the pressure of everything, and having to continually fight, just continually just pushing it, um, you know, she's done incredible, incredible things, you know? Yeah, so the album was, received pretty well by the music critics it was quite amazing um, some of the reviews that came in you know um, getting to do things like be on the cover of knowledge magazine and yeah. getting invited to be on the co cover of DJ magazine which is was huge for me because it's such a big magazine and still is huge to me to this day um, but in terms of like just people's general criticism man there was a lot of hate like a lot of hate. Well, who is she and what did she do? What did she do to get there? You know, like I have a magic vagina or something. <laughs> and when you're 24 years old and you've just busted onto the scene and you're not used to that kind of trolling stuff, you know, it can really take its toll on a person. And there were definitely days where I was like, why am I even doing this? A lot of people see artists up on stage or in videos or whatever and think, yeah, it must be a great life and everything. And, you know, there's great things about it, but it's bloody hard work. I think the people that make it, people that are successful, are the ones who really, really believe in themselves, really want to be successful, and Tony's one of those people. The only thing you can do is deflect it back, you know, just put up your shield, take a deep breath, go on stage and smash it. <laughs> So after Blazing, we talked about making a video for Lyric On My Lip. And I was like, I want to use the same guys, Phil and Ollie, because they really understood me. I felt like they, you know, they got what I was about. Lyric On My Lip. We did kind of nice, posh looking storyboards in the end. So, you know, it keeps the record label happy, but not many people understand quite much. Yeah, the, the idea is that she can't, she's, she's got the lyric in her song, and she's trying to get the lyric out, and she's like, what is it, you know, I, I know what I'm trying to sing, I just, I've got the vibe right, so she puts on a record and the beat starts kicking in so hard that the walls start shaking. And the walls explode and she's kind of, you know, in this fun kind of... Lyric was shot inside these massive studios and the heating had broken down, so it was freezing cold, I'm wearing like a bikini top. They're spraying me with water to make me look hot and sweaty. But I'm for reason, it's like turning to ice on my chest. We're on such a tight budget, and it's like, right, we can, you know, we want all money on screen. So it's either we have more time in the studio or we have the heat. People were like standing around in like boots and jackets, and like, you could see your breath, it was so cold. Yeah. Fuck, that's flash. <laughs> Oh, is that crust in there? Is that dye in there? Is that dynamite in your video? What the fuck, you know what I mean? Yeah, I remember seeing the lyric on my lip video um, come out with all the things crashing and banging around. But you, but the thing about that was when you saw videos that were made overseas, they just had a like a superior look to them, I suppose. And that's that sort of added gravity to what Tali was doing and charting at thirty nine on the UK charts. I mean, at that time, that was that was such a massive feat for a Kiwi artist to do. When uh, Ronnie got in touch about. Tali's uh, album and we had, we had this uh, opportunity to do this remix. And and I, remember, I remember you being excited. Yeah, I was well excited. I was well, well excited. Ronnie called me up, he wants a remix. 
was a big deal for us back then as well, you know. Of course, what to be involved with Full Cycle and yeah. obviously get involved with Tardy's exciting new project and that and a new talent coming through. So, um, totally. yeah. And even now, looking back, I'm like, wow, I was so lucky to have those people agree to do the remixes and to do such amazing jobs. You know, mm-hmm. like um, the remixes really are what sent the tunes skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. You know, we had like DJ Markey, Origin Unknown, Andy C, Shy FX, AI, Ed Russian Optical, Crust and Clips, D Product. Um, I know I'm missing mm-hmm. somebody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah. It is. Dillinger. Yep, yep. My gosh. You know, so, um, yeah, I remember when they said to me, okay, if you could have anyone remix your tunes, who would you want to remix mm-hmm. them? And, I, you know, I was throwing these names around, never in a million years thinking that that would actually happen. Uh, I think at the time, I think Becky from Full Cycle, she, uh, she called my managers who wants us to do the remix. And... Uh, I really, really, really enjoyed doing the remix for for this tune. We did the AI thing to that tune, didn't it? <laughs> it had a little niche and a little cult following on that one, but yeah, it was enjoyable. That was such a joy to make because that was actually lyrics that came from a book of, of writing that I did when I was living in Melbourne. And it was like a really hot night and I couldn't sleep. I got up, I started writing lyrics. And those lyrics ended up becoming the words to Lyric on My Lip. And I remember wrapping them over this beat that Ronnie played and him being like, brilliant, get into the studio, get, you know, get into the booth right now. And that was actually the first take. Like the rap you hear on Lyric on My Lip is the first take that I did. Okay, take this out, yeah. That's what I came to England with. It's like turned up on a on doorstep of Ronnie's size with song books. Songs that I then started to convert thinking about how I'd make them into drum bass tunes. These are songs like Grey Days, which are on the album. Oh, the Grey Day as a city I mean, if you listen to that, that is rough and raw as it gets, man. And it's the first take. And it's one whole stream of singing. Like, I don't even think I planned how that song was going to go. I literally got in there and just sang what I had on the words in front of me. So if you listen to it, you know, I listen back to that song and I'm like, Phew, we could have retaken some of that stuff. But I also love the fact that that was, that was what it was like to work with Crust. Crust was like, nah, raw, ready. This is how it sounds. This is the emotion. I remember looking through the glass and him sitting there like loving it, you know, and feeling it. And that's what we ended up using. Most of the songs on the album are produced by Ronnie. So um, after I moved to Bristol, um, we kind of completed the album by filling it with tunes that weren't drum and bass tunes because I, I really wanted to to um, show showcase my songwriting skills. And, you know, if you're just writing over drum and bass all the time, you don't always get an opportunity to sort of say more poetic kind of things. Mm. And I grew up listening, to, you know, to like R&B and soul music and I really wanted tunes on the album that reflected that so people could see that I was diverse and not just someone trick pony. Yeah, like, don't blame me. I wrote that for my ex-boyfriend who I left behind in Melbourne. So that, you know, that was really heartfelt when I wrote that. Take a look. That was kind of like a middle finger to everyone who'd sort of tried to come along for the ride with me for, for the wrong reasons, you know. He's hurting me hard like the beat of a big fat drum. And it's getting so bad that I feel I've no choice but to turn on my heels. I caught up with uh, Tiki recently, Tiki Tane, um, around that, that time. He was coming over to Europe to play with his band Summon Al Dub and we would try and catch up with each other because he's one of my best friends. You know, we kind of came up together in, in Christchurch. And uh, we saw each other and we had this really amazing meeting. It was like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, you know, it was, it was all really cool. And then um, we got back, uh, he got back to New Zealand. I called him and, I, and we were having a conversation. And I said, oh, I'm writing a song about you. And he goes, that's funny because I'm writing a song about you. <laughs> and he started writing um, Long Time for me. It's good to see. That, that's me. That's about me, that song. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> and I actually started writing Soul Star about him just about the words of positivity he gave me, you know, encouragement. And I also included um, a little kind of uh, reference to Kinkapisi and Shefu, Conkle Dawn and Shapeshifter, people who also were really sort of influential um, while I was kind of getting into drama bass and, cu- and coming out. And then there was other tunes that were sort of just danceable bangers, you know, like um, 
the sound gonna catch ya, watch out, gonna catch ya, and pressure release, which I did with Clips, who I was dating at the time. Um, those were the sort of like dance floor bangers that we wanted to, to get in there as well. Yeah, a lot of people ask me, do I have a favorite? And people think it's gonna be Lyric and Blazing because, or High Hopes, you know. Actually, High Hopes I really love because that is a classic tune that Ronnie and I wrote for the summer. We were like, right, let's write a summer tune that we can take to the festivals, that we can play at Glastonbury, that we can play in Miami. So High Hopes was one of those tunes where we really set out to make a banger. We knew, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. And I remember I recorded it with Ronnie and I hadn't heard it, the finished product. And I went to an after party at his house, as we so often did. And um, I remember being downstairs and being like, where's Ronnie? Where's, where's, you know, where's Jay? Where's, where's Peter? Where's this person? Where's that person? And I walked up the stairs and I could hear this music coming out of his studio. And I remember opening the studio doors and there was about 20 people crammed into his studio, raving out to high hopes. And I'm like, oh my God, it's me. It's my chair. Everyone's like, yes, Tali, where could you? And Ronnie's like, oh yeah, this is the finished track. The track for me, when I, you know, because I listened back to this album the other day as well, and I'm still, the track for me was High Hopes. I hope so, because like, when you say MC Tally, everybody thinks she's an MC. But when you check her out, that girl can sing. And when she came and she was rocking it in the clubs and all that, you mostly heard her just kind of MCing. But when she kind of recorded the album, then you could see more of that talent coming out, the singing side of her. And um, yeah, High Hopes, I mean, there's a bunch of great tracks on there, but for me, I Hopes was just the one for me, man. I love that tune. Just, I still love it now, man. On stage, you know, it was all about being tough and one of the boys and being able to record these songs that showed this femininity and this, this, you know, sexual side of me was really empowering too. Don't Let Me Wake Up. That was an R&B tune featuring Dynamite. And I remember going to his house and he cooked me this beautiful lunch and then we went upstairs into the studio and we kind of fabricated this booth using mattresses and duvets and blankets you know and, and kind of made this tune and at the end of it Di was like right okay so I've made an R&B tune <laughs> you know like it was kind of surprising for, for both of us to adapt with working with these people with different ways of working, you know, like Crust being quite raw and Dynam uh, Di being quite um, fastidious about certain parts of the song. You know, he'll, he'll spend half an hour working on the first minute, you know? Um, and then Ronnie, Ronnie and I just uh, was more about just kind of like, okay, this is what we want and this is how we're going to do it. And it, it felt a little bit more um, sort of planned. For me, a real great experience to work with someone who was passionate, someone who had like ideas about, you know, doing something that was out of her comfort zone. She was uh, musically trained. She had a visual uh, idea about what she wanted. You know, it was a pleasure to be in the studio with her. It's funny because a lot of people seem to think that I gave myself that name, like I just bestowed myself with the name <laughs> of the first lady, yeah. um, when that is not the case at all. Um, in no way, shape or form am I trying to claim like I'm the first lady ever to MC because of course, as I mentioned earlier, there were other female MCs before me who laid down the foundations mm -hmm. for me to come through. Yeah. So it's it's, no, it's nothing to do with that. Um, it was a nickname that, that Dynamite actually gave me, Dynamite MC. Uh, I looked back on some old um, video footage the other day and there's actually a shot of him on stage going, welcome on stage, the princess of drum and bass, the first lady of Full Cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was about. It was that I was the first lady to be signed to Full Cycle Records right. as an individual artist. I graciously accept the title. <laughs> Anybody who's bringing any originality and any kind of quality to this music, to this scene, is going to help it, it's going to improve it. It's going to allow it to have more diversity. It's, it's going to allow it to have people to have more options, more listening options. It's going to bring different people to the to the club as well. You know, some people will go and see Tally that wouldn't necessarily go and see a DJ. Tally was such a pioneer in terms of female emceeing, and not only, uh, you know, one of the few, not one of the many, in terms of being a female in that male-dominated MC world, but also being a female MC from New Zealand. The thing about Tally is she's so diverse. So she can sing like an angel and soulful, lyrical delivery, but then she can switch it and be a badass rapper at the same time. It just gave all the girls in DMB that girl power kind of thing to see one of their girls just kind of like, wow, fronting the full cycle co collective, holding her home with MC Dynamite 
And I think that gave a lot of inspiration to a lot of girls like, wow, you go, girl. I was a budding singer at the time. So it made me realise I can do this, I can sing in drum and bass, you know? I learned shitloads off Tally. Like, live, she is one of the greatest fucking MCs, drum and bass MCs there is. And so I've um, definitely stolen some things off her. <laughs> Just sort of like delivery and just little wee rhythm patterns, da -da 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 -da, things like that. And then also, she's given me more confidence to sing as well. Instead of just being the dudes up there and going, blah, 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 and doing the heavy kind of rugger and in your face kind of rubbing, that kind of stuff. She's given me confidence to be able to open up my lungs a little more and sing a little more. So, thank you, Tali. Love you, sis. <laughs> and the winner is. Tali! have any sort of one to guide me at any one point um, and definitely I didn't have any woman to guide me so I really looked to the guys to kind of show me the way and we're all such different personalities. There were definitely times where the boys were like my protectors, my big brothers, you know they would have my back and, and they would they would you know bring me into situations and it was very clear that I was with them and not to be messed with and you know don't look at her funny. <laughs> There were fights, there were arguments, there were disagreements, you know, there were like screaming matches even sometimes um, because we're all big personalities, you know, um, getting to know each other in quite a quick space of time. But for the most part, um, I think, you know, we had this really beautiful relationship and friendship and, you know, Ronnie and, and Crust would even say, you know, we were like, we were like, we were family. It was a pleasure to work with you and to, uh to be able to tour and to do live shows and to fulfill the vision and to make, make things happen. And for a small independent record label like Full Cycle to be able to do that, for me was really refreshing. It was something that was very special. Working with Tali was working with an inspiring woman who helped me find my strength growing up. We were a strong group of girls that really looked after each other and supported each other through a very male-dominated industry. Um, if I would have known what we, how good it was back then, I probably would have appreciated it more. Um, but it's only when you look back you realise how good it really was. Even when you listen back now to recordings of back in the day, you know, going to America, going to parts of Europe, going all over the world. Do you know what I mean? She sounds clear, she sounds precise, she sounds dynamic, she sounds original and she, you know, she is a unique artist. Being on stage, you know, for me always just felt so empowering, especially being with, you know, Tali and Zanaya. Um, it was, you know, exciting, exhilarating. We did really feel like we were doing something quite different at that time, being kind of, you know, girls, you know, females in drum and bass, which was very, very rare then. So yeah, we felt like we were forward and ahead of the game. Looking back, you know, there's a lot of people I have to thank for helping me get where I got. Of course, the Full Cycle crew, you know, I couldn't have done this without Ronnie taking a punt on me and Crust and Die and Sav and D Product and Surge and Dynamite MC all working with me and supporting me in the way that they did and Gerard and Becky at the label. You know, there was there's so many people who kind of banded around me and who, who had the dream alongside me. You know, we, we all had this dream together. I've got to big up Frost and Brian G from uh, from V Recordings and all the movement crew, the fabric crew, the DMB Arena crew. You know, all these people that sort of said, yeah, okay, <laughs> this little firecracker, all right, we'll give her a chance. Um, and of course, I want to really acknowledge the fact that as a, a white woman from a foreign country, you know, I've, I've benefited and, and profited off um, music of black origin and black culture and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. I 100% acknowledge that I wouldn't be where I am or doing what I did without those people who laid down the foundations and, and paved the way for people like me to come through. I've been in this industry for 18 years now and this is my first ever nomination for anything. <laughs> I am dedicating this award to all my
my drum and bass soldiers out there, I am proud to be your first lady. And to all of the musicians and artists in this room, oh my God, I am so blessed and so grateful to be a part of a rich and colourful industry and now history. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou koutou. Thank you. This is MC Tali. Thank you for tuning in to the Rick on my lift. 15 year celebration and I hope to see you all again over the next 15 years. Yeah.